group, the Cnidarians, which is Greek for nettle. Nid is a nettle. Uh, when you walk into a, a group of stinging nettles, what happens? You get stung. Because the stinging nettles have these little, uh, almost glass-like projections on the bottoms of their leaves that uh, will break off and uh, penetrate your skin and irritate you. And, and they actually have some toxins in it. Well, there's something similar, uh, analogous in uh, the Cnidarians. This includes hydroids, jellyfish, and anemones. They have stinging cells. And so they all have a certain type of larva called a planula larva. And it's these two of these, these are two of the characteristics that relate these all together in the same phylum. So first of all, let's talk about the hydroids in the class Hydrozoa. And hydroids mean water animals in Greek. Most of these are colonial. And they do have two stages. There's a medusa stage and a polyp stage. The polyp stages are attached to something. The medusas are, are free swimming, like little tiny jelly, jellyfish. But the polyp stages are most predominant. And the polyps are, are polymorphic, which means they assume different forms some can, and functions. Uh, some can be feeding and, some can, and defensive, and some are uh, strictly re reproductive. Um, you may recall from high school biology of an animal called Obelia. It was one that's usually, and this is a diagram of Obelia. Um, Many of these have a, a, an exoskeleton uh, formed by something called chitin, which is a complex polysaccharide. And chitin is kind of ubiquitous in a lot of the uh, invertebrates. It's actually, uh, it's actually find, found in uh, fungi too. Some mushrooms have chitin. Have chitin. Anyway, it forms an exoskeleton, this dark line around this diagram, and it's called the hydrotheca. And <clears throat> individual colonies are connected to each other by uh, these horizontal stems called stolons, kind of like the stolon on a strawberry plant, you know, because a, a strawberry plant can se send out these horizontal stems and make a new plant. So, here are some of the uh, hydroids we'll uh, see in the intertidal zone. There are others, uh, um, probably a lot of others, and I just haven't identified them yet. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the fur hydroid, of course, C fur hydroid, a betanaria, and it looks kind of like a hair hanging off rocks, a kind of a, a, a yellowish brown hair. Another one, the ostrich plume hydroid, Aglophenia, uh, looks like a, a feather. And you can see my fingers down here. You'll see these uh, sometimes live, sometimes you'll see a, a clumps of them washed up on the beach. Another one, uh, this is more in Neetarts Bay than down in the uh, rocky intertidal zone, although I found it there, uh, called the orange hydroid. It's uh, very bright. Another one without, this one does not have the, uh, the exoskeleton, the uh, hydro, the, this is called a thecate because it doesn't have a, uh, an exoskeleton. It just has the uh, polyp and it's called the fur hydroid. Now there's another one down there, which in order to see it, you have to get wet. <laughs> It's kind of on the outside of the rocks there, and there's one, and I'll point it out to you when we, uh, or point, point out to its, its location when we go down there. It's just, it's, you have to, unless it's a really, really a low tide, uh, you have to kind of wade out to it, and it's in kind of a cave and a tunnel on some of the outer rocks. And it's called a hydrocoral. It's not a true coral, 
but it has an exoskeleton that is made of calcium carbonate. And it's bright pink. It's, and it coats the, it's encrusting and coats the walls of this little cave. And you can see the big anemones around here. This, I mean, this anemone is cut several inches across. And you can see all this bright, hot pink coral encrusting hydro, uh, animal here, coral like. And we have one other hydrozoan, which you've all seen at one time or another. Uh, this is Valella Valella, the by the wind sailors. It is a colony of animals, and they belong to the order Siphonophora, which means bearing tubes. And on their float, they have a float, and all these little tubes that keep, keep them afloat. And it is a colony of animals, uh, and these animals are polymorphic, these polyps. Uh, some are defensive, and some are reproductive. And here there's one that is uh, a feeding polyp, the gastrozoid. Zoid is kind of a catch-all term for any individual in a colony. And it's not restricted to hydrozoans. So also there is a sail on this, and that sail is set at an angle of about 45 degrees. And in different parts of the world, it will set be set at different angles. But ours is set at about a 45 degree, and it takes advantage of the north, prevailing north winds. And to sail up and or down the coast, generally in north winds. However, the wind sh shifts from either blowing east or west, it will uh, blow the uh, these uh, by the wind sailors either offshore or onshore, and that's when we see the most is when they are blown onshore by these uh, westerly winds. Okay, the jellyfish, the scyphozoa. Scyphozoa means cup animal, and you're probably familiar with this one. Many of you have seen this on the beach, it's sometimes up to a foot across. This is the moon jelly washed up on the shore and we get, get them every so often, you know, um, several times a year. These bright purple and uh, you know, white things in the middle are the gonads. In the scyphozoa, the, it's the medusa stage, the jellyfish stage that uh, is pr predominant. There are polyps and uh, some species, but some, not in all of them. The, the moon jelly does have a polyp stage. And they reproduce by budding or strobilization. The tentacles have the sting, stinging cells. The stinging cells are called nematocyst. So they have a, this bell-shaped organ. Uh, inside the jelly is called a mesoglea. And they have a balancing organ called a stat statocyst. And a whole series of canals for uh, feeding and nutrient uh, distribution. And around the edge of the bell is called the vellum, which is kind of muscular, and that gives the jellyfish the pulsing action they can use for swimming. And then, of course, there's the tentacles that are armed with the uh, nematocyst, the stinging cells. And jellyfish are carnivorous. They will catch fish and other animals. This is one uh, in the water. This picture was taken by my niece, who was a scuba diver up in uh, Puget Sound. So this is out of Puget Sound. I thought this was a great photograph. You can see all of the, the canals radiate, radiating out to, from the center and branching into the, uh, to the edge of the jellyfish. Here's the life cycle of this particular jellyfish. Uh, the adult has a, a planula larva, which settles usually in a shaded place and develops a young polyp. That polyp starts growing uh, new little jellyfish in kind of a stro 
what we call a strobola, kind of a layered structure. And then these uh, young jellyfish or young medusas break off and become adults. Uh, the scientific name of that uh, young medusa is called a nephira. Sometimes you'll run across that term. The stinging cells. Now, we're going to run across the stinging cells, and probably you have already, uh, especially when we're in the intertidal zone, the anemones have them in their tentacles. And their stinging cells are not really uh, strong enough to, prevent, to penetrate our skin. You can touch the, the tentacles and you get this kind of sticky uh, reaction. You can feel your fingers stick to the, the uh, tentacles, but they don't hurt. But in other animals, like some jellyfish, we can re really we can sting you, you can feel the sting. And then there are some in the world, such as the box jellyfish in the, in the Western Pacific off uh, Australia, which can kill you. And it doesn't take just a, a slight strength, a sting can put you in the hospital. Uh, another one that uh, is noted for stingy is the Portuguese man of, man of war. And uh, I have been stung by the Portuguese man of war. Um, not the big ones in the uh, um, Gulf, of, Gulf of Mexico, but the ones in the Gulf of California, which are a little bit smaller. But it was like <laughs> wading into a swarm of hornets. It did hurt. So inside the, uh, this uh, nematocyst, a single cell, is a cavity that contains a series of, a, an arrangement of stylets, little, little spear-like things. And there's a, a little door over the top of that cell kind of called an operculum. And then there's a trigger called the nido cell. So if this nido cell is disturbed, the door will open and then this, these stylets will come shooting out and penetrate whatever is disturbing it, such as your finger, or if they are looking for prey, uh, it could be a prey item. Okay, here's some of the jellyfish we all we'll find around our area. Besides the moon jelly, uh, you'll see this washed up on the beach. This is a sea nettle, and it can sting. I've picked them up. I've never been stung, but uh, they do have a, a reputation for having a little bit of a sting. Uh, this is one that was uh, alive down at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Uh, another one is called the water jelly. We'll find washed up on the beach occasionally. Another one here is the red-eyed medusa, polyorcus. Um, when I first learned about polyorcus, I thought that was a kind of a cool name, uh, polyorcus, and it rolled off your tongue. But it must be some Greek goddess. Until I translated it from Greek, and polyorcus means many testes, so I guess it wasn't a goddess after all. But it does have little... Uh, eye spots, red eye spots at the base of the tentacles that are light sensitive. So, the anthozoans, the sea anemones. And anthozoan means flower animals, and people at one time thought these were flowers. They can be either solitary or colonial. They do, they do not have a, medus, a medusa. And they consist of a, <laughs> a circle of tentacles around a mouth, <laughs> essentially. And then there's an interior structure. And the tentacles, as I said, have a nematocyst. And these animals are carnivorous. And another thing about the, especially about this green anemone, which you'll see down on the beat, on the rocky intertidal, these are the two, two that you will see the most. There are some others in Neetarts Bay uh, that do not uh, inhabit the rocky intertidal, uh, at least where we are, but there are some in Neetarts Bay that are different species. 
And if you go to our website, you'll see them. But we have the green, uh, the giant uh, green surf anemone, or, or giant gr green anemone, and the pink tip anemone. Anthopleura elegantissima and Anthopleura xanthogramica. Now, the green one is green because it contains a symbiotic one cell green algae living in its tissues. And this is a truly mutualistic arrangement between the algae and the anemone in that they both benefit from it. it gives a place, the anemone gives the, a place for the algae to live and the algae photosynthesizes and actually supplies some of the food to the anemone. So, now, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually, but asexual reproduction is their main reproductive strategy, and they do it by splitting. Most of them, there's a couple species that do it by budding. There's one called the, the common name is the budding anatomy, Epiactus prolifera, uh, which we should have around here, but I haven't seen it. But anyway, this is the pink lip, pink tentacle uh, anemone, and when they're out of the water, the tentacles are retracted in towards the mouth and covered up, and they attach to these little bits of shell and sand to their uh, bodies. I think people, I'm not quite sure why, but possibly to prevent uh, overheating, say the white uh, particles uh, reflect sunlight and heat and so on. Or it might be a camouflage thing. But all of these in a colony are clones. In other words, they're genetically identical. But we can have different clones near each other. And they don't like each other. One clone does not like another clone. And some of these uh, anemones in the clone are kind of specialized. Those in the center of the clone are specialized towards reproduction. But those on the edges of the clones are defensive. They're, they're the soldiers. And clones will battle each other. So we have clone wars. Those on the outer edges of the uh, clone will attack the animals on the edge of another clone when they start getting too close together. And they will actually, they will shoot their nematocysts into each other to the point where they can kill each other. And there, if the space between the two clones is called, people call it the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. So, and those on the actual edge of the, uh, these defensive uh, anemones will change their tentacles to be kind of club shaped. And uh, you can recognize them as having kind of a different appearance when they're tentacles are out and they're ready to fight each other. So let's see. Any questions on and then anemones and their relatives? We don't have any in the box yet. Um, okay. Oh wait, we do have one now. Do you do okay. clones of different species fight? The clones will battle uh, clones of a different species also. There's some videos on YouTube you'll show you that. Uh, one of one or two of which you sent me, Chrissy. So I, I looked up some more. <laughs> There's another. Can the um I I'll let you answer this. Uh, can they move across the rocks? Can an enemy's move? Ah, uh, yes, they can. Um, they have this area down here is called the the pedal disc or foot disc, and it is attached, but they can detach and move. And if there is a predator approaching them, like a starfish, uh, they can get up and get out of the way. 
And there's actually one species that can uh, almost swim. And there's some videos on it. Um, how do they attract the shell and debris again that, that's covering them that you said maybe for? Uh, I think it, it just settles on them. Because very often um, see, on the outside of the, the animal are these little projections called tubercles that are somewhat adhesive. And uh, sand will wash over these uh, uh, aggregating anemones. And in fact, they can live for long periods of time, up to a couple months buried in sand. And once they're exposed again, uh, sand will wash up, but wash out, but they'll retain a lot of these uh, particles. Okay. So they just, uh, they're just able to hold on to them once they land on them. Yes. Uh, with the, the little tubercles on the outside. One, another phylum that looks similar, but it is not related to the uh, cnidaria, is the phylum tenophora, which are comb jellies. And tenophora in Greek means bearing combs. combs. And uh, we have one that you will see on the beach almost all the time much of the year, called the sea gooseberry. It's the only one we have around here that belongs to the uh, Tenophora. And they are characterized by these eight rows of ciliary plates um, called teens, or cones. And these are used for kind of limited swimming movements. They're jelly-like, and there are Worldwide, there are many different body plans. So some of them are strap-like, some of them are long and cylindrical, all different shapes. The only one we have around here is this globular one that's about the size of a small marble. And you'll find them washed up on the beach. Uh, some have tentacles, including this one, but uh, you probably won't see the tentacles because they get broken off and then they're washed through the waves. Um, they are predatory, predatory. they uh, are carnivorous. They're mostly a hermaphroditic, meaning they are both males and females in the same animal. So this one's called Pleurobrachia, the sea gooseberry. And they have a different larva from the uh, cnidarian. It's called the uh, cydipid larva. I'm not gonna go into the embryology of invertebrates uh, when I was in college, I had to take a whole class in that. Okay, here's a diagram of, of our um, sea gooseberry, and you can see the eight rows of plates, uh, ciliary plates, and they do have a mouth at the bottom. They have a little balancing organ so they know which is up and down, called the statocyst, and these rows of comb, combs. And this is a uh, the comb, the picture of the comb that I took up from under a microscope. So you can see the cilia. Cilia are hair-like projections out of the cell. So and usually they are flexible and they can, uh, the animal can control, control their motion. Cilia are ubiquitous through the animal kingdom. Okay, worms.